And we are recording. Thank you. I am calling to order this regular meeting of the Nun Planning Board on Monday, September 14, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. And this is being uh, held uh, remotely via Microsoft Teams. And with that, I will turn to Tim Corwin of the city staff to review the meeting procedures. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Tim Corwin with the planning department and uh, David Brooks, the planning director is here as well. Um, due to the coronavirus pandemic and pursuant to Governor Sununu's emergency order number 12 issued on March 23rd, 2020, in accordance with the executive order 2020-04, the Lebanon Plain Board is authorized to meet electronically without a quorum physically present in the same location. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with emergency order number 12, the city has taken action to provide public access to the meeting by telephone with potential additional access by video to provide public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting and to provide a mechanism for the public to alert uh, the, the board during the meeting if there are problems with access. For this meeting, Microsoft Teams is being used as the communication platform. All members of the planning board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously, and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and to participate in the meeting by visiting lebanonnh.gov forward slash live and clicking on the link for the September 14th planning board meeting. Instructions on how to attend are provided on the webpage. To assist in the preparation of the meeting minutes and to ensure all participants are aware of who is participating, all speakers are asked to identify themselves and to spell their first and last names before beginning to speak. Likewise, we ask all board members to please identify yourself before speaking. Uh, in order to ensure the best possible transmission of the meeting content, it is suggested that you disable the camera on your chosen device to reduce the video feed and increase the available bandwidth for all attendees. To improve sound quality and reduce the amount of feedback in the system, microphones will be muted by staff until you have a question or comment. For people using the Microsoft Teams platform, you can unmute yourself by clicking the microphone icon that appears on the Teams platform if you hover your cursor on the middle lower half of your screen. For people calling in by phone, please press star six to unmute yourself. If anyone has difficulty with access during the course of the meeting, please email us at planning at lebanonnh.gov, planning at lebanonnh.gov, or, uh, or you can use the chat function on Microsoft Teams to indicate the issue that you're having. If we can provide technical assistance, we will try to do so. If we are unable to do so, it is still worthwhile to be aware of problems that participants may be encountering so that we can try and address those for future meetings. In the event that we experience widespread and severe technical difficulties such that we are unable to continue holding the meeting, we will adjourn the meeting and reschedule to a later date and time. All votes that are taken during the meeting tonight shall be done by roll call vote. Uh, we ask that you not use the Microsoft Teams chat function unless you need to communicate that you're experiencing technical difficulties. Note that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, it will be available on the city's website uh, at lebanonnh.gov forward slash agenda center. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Tim. Uh, before I proceed to a roll call, I sadly must inform you all that Tom Martz has resigned from the board for personal reasons. I really miss his presence, his uh, insights, uh, his participation in various subcommittees. Um, he's going to leave a hole behind, and I really re regret his departure. Um, with that sad piece of information, I'll proceed to a roll call like I do each meeting. Um, in alphabetical order uh, by first name, uh, and please identify not only whether you're present, but if you're alone, wherever you are located. So I am obviously here and I am alone. Gregorio, I don't see a button for him yet. Uh, Jerry? Uh, I'm here and I'm alone. Joan? Joan is here and alone. Jim Winnie? Councillor Winnie is present and alone. Kathy. I'm here and alone. And Kim. Present and alone. All right, now we will see if uh, Gregorio joins us later. And with that, I will turn it over to David Brooks for the notice of regional impact. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. <clears throat> Prior to today's planning uh, cutoff, the, the planning department received two new applications for the planning board. 
The first application is from Janet Wong as the applicant and Virginia Wong as the property owner. 43 Mechanic Street, tax map 106, lot 34, zoned in the Lebanon Downtown District. This is a request for site plan review to convert an existing three-unit multifamily dwelling to a six-unit multifamily dwelling. The second application is for one Mechanic Street LLC and FSP LLC, one Mechanic Street, tax map 91, lot 264, and zero Foundry Street, tax map 91, lot 262, both zoned in the Lebanon Downtown District. It's a request for site plan review to convert an existing three-story commercial building at one Foundry, at, sorry, at one Mechanic Street to an 18 unit multifamily dwelling together with associated site improvements and a request for a conditional use permit per section 607.5.A of the zoning ordinance to allow parking for the proposed multifamily use to be located at zero Foundry Street. Planning office recommends that neither of these applications has the potential for regional impact. May I have a motion from uh a board member that neither of these has regional impact. So moved by Monroe. Thank you, Joan. Uh, second. Kathy, second. Thank you, Kathy. Any discussion? So I will do a uh, roll call. Uh, Kim in favor. Aye. Kathy. Aye. Jim. Aye. Joan? Joan in favor. Jerry? Jerry votes aye. I'm sorry I didn't catch that. Jerry votes aye. Jerry. I, I apologize. Uh, Gregorio, have you arrived? And I vote in favor, so that's six in favor. By the way, I forgot to mention that Laurel had messaged me a couple of days ago signifying that she wouldn't be here. That's why I didn't include her name in the roll call. Um, so we'll now turn to new applications. Uh, we only have two, as you can see. Uh, the second one um, was withdrawn by the applicant. So let's start with Dana Sagan. Um, and I don't know, David, would, maybe we could expedite this a little bit. If you could give an introduction, explain to the board what's going on. Uh, sure. Uh, this is an application um, for a conversion of an existing three unit apartment building into three condominium units uh, for ownership purposes. The subdivision regulations were modified uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, and there was a change to at that time, there was a change to the language of section 6.3. Um, whereby changes in changes changes related to the con, uh, conversion to condominiums uh, now triggers planning board review, but only to the extent that uh, the board deems necessary to ensure that the underlying existing use of the property will not be materially altered by the conversion. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time we've had a conversion uh, of existing units to condominium form of ownership that triggered this particular uh, new language. Prior to 2013, uh, there was a, a specific exemption in the definition of subdivision that exempted existing units and, and exactly this kind of conversion. Uh, from the definition of subdivision and therefore from subdivision review. Um, the reason that this change was made back in 2013, uh, the city's attorney was uh, happened to be involved on a project in another community whereby a seasonal campground was being converted to condominium form of ownership. So there was a uh, fairly dramatic change in the nature of the use of that property from uh, a seasonal operation to year round use. And he thought it was a, uh, appropriate and important that the board 
should have the ability to review these kinds of conversions uh, just to verify whether or not there is a, uh, an, a significant change in the nature of the use. Uh, I don't believe staff finds that to be the case here, but nonetheless, the current language um, does require that the board review the application just to, to make that finding. And I'll, uh, if it's okay with you, Chair, I will turn it over to, to Mr. Corwin, who actually did the review of this application. Beyond Please. that. Yep. Uh, thank you, David. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have too much more to add. The, the, um, the staff uh, doesn't see a substantial change of use here, and therefore, or, or a material change to the use, and, and therefore it doesn't doesn't see a need to, to review uh, this proposal as a full application. Any comments from the applicant? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? This is Nicholas Burke. Yes, Mr. Burke, please go ahead. All right, thank you. So I, I represent uh, Dana Seguin, and in the summer of 2019, uh, I assisted him in uh, preparing and uh, recording the uh, a declaration of condominium for his property at 17 Summer Street. Um, and that was all filed with the uh, Grafton County Registry of Deeds. And um, I have to admit, um, I was not aware at the time that the section of the zoning ordinance with respect to condominium convergence had been changed. And my experience in the past uh, was that this did not constitute a subdivision. So we did not at that time uh, apply for subdivision approval or at least review uh, by the planning board. Um, in this particular case, uh, Mr. Segwin's property at 17 Summer Street uh, before the conversion consisted of three residential apartment units uh, in, a, in the building at 17 Summer Street. And by the declaration of condominium, uh, <clears throat> it is being converted to three condominium units also used uh, exclusively for residential purposes. Um, there are no changes whatsoever to the site. Uh, there are no changes to the structure of the building, no uh, improvements or alterations whatsoever. Uh, and the use going forward after the conversion is going to be the same as the use uh, prior to the conversion, and that is for use as uh, 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 three separate residences. So I think we fall within uh, the uh, requirement that the planning board's involvement would be limited to the review to ensure that the underlying existing use of the property will not be materially altered. And in this case, it will not be altered in any way whatsoever. It's going to be residential before or residential after without any changes to either the lot or the building or structure uh, whatsoever. So we're hoping that you will review and approve uh, this conversion. Um, it has already been noted by the uh, city uh, assessing department uh, who have reassessed the property as three separate units. Um, so we're hoping that the planning board will uh, concur that there is in fact no material change in use uh, and that uh, this was a, an appropriate conversion just in the form of ownership rather than any other. Uh, any questions, comments from board members? M M Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, this yeah. is Tim. Yeah, Tim. Um, I, I, I forgot to, um, uh, to prompt you to do the completeness review. Um, and so in, 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 in right. light of that, uh, D David, uh, David kindly reminded me. Um, so the, um, the plan to plan development department has reviewed the application and, um, uh, recommends that the application is complete enough for the board to accept jurisdiction and to commence its review. Thank you. Uh, I made that there also may i have a motion from board member to that effect this is monroe so moves thank you joan a second jerry Council, any will second yeah, thank you jerry any discussion so i'm going to do a different gregorio have you arrived no so I will start with Jerry in favor. Jerry votes aye. Joan? Joan votes yes. Jim? Councilor Winnie votes aye. Kathy? I have a question first. Um, just voting yes on this does not affect any comments we would have with no, regard no, to this completeness. 
Okay. Right. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Kim? Kim votes yes. And I vote yes. So uh, that is unanimous, the six of us. Then, Mr. Chair, this is Tim. Can I just make one more comment? Please. Um, the um, if if the the board the board's task is is to determine under section six point three um, whether the uh, again when, whether the underlying existing use of the property will be materially materially altered by the conversion the proposed conversion to a condominium form of ownership. But the board finds that it is not, then that is then that that is the action to be taken by the board to find that uh, to the contrary if the board finds that there will be uh, the, the underlying use is materially altered by the proposed condominium conversion then uh, the application would have to come back uh, with further um, uh, w to, to, to meet all of the submission uh, requirements of the uh, of the minor su subdivision regulations. The, the one of the reasons I'm pointing this out at this point is because in, in, under staff recommendations in the staff memo page three, um, it suggested that uh, a plat would be recorded um, necessarily, and that's not that's not the case if the board decides again that there is no material difference uh, with the proposed conversion. So um, the 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 recommendation is moot um, if, if the board does not find a material change. All right, and, and I guess you and David are much closer than any board members to any changes that you've been able to identify, correct? And I guess well, board not. members are allowed to have their own opinion regardless I of agree, Kathy. I'm just finishing off with Tim. Yes, it was we, we didn't see any, but that doesn't mean that the board right. Okay, I'm just finishing off on, on the staff side of it. So Kathy. Yes, I have some concerns with regard to uh, altering the nature. I think when you have an ownership in the by the entirety of a of three unit, which was a non-conforming three unit. Uh, you have one owner who makes a decision about what happens on that property. And once you divide it into three or two or four or whatever condominium units, it's changed because no one owner can make a decision about that property. And furthermore, I think the only opportunity that the city has to upgrade the safety concerns of these 150-year-old houses that populate downtown Lebanon is when a change is brought before the city. Most of these older buildings, and we can ask specifically uh, about this one, do not have updated wiring. They, many of them still have the old knob and tube. Uh, they often don't have interconnected carbon monoxide and smoke detectors within each unit. They don't often have firewalls between each unit, which would be required if someone was submitting to the city to convert a, a large old house into a three unit. They may not have egress windows in every bedroom. And they may not have separate electric meters so that if this ends up being three separate owners, one person puts an air conditioning unit in every room of the house and leaves them on 24 hours a day and you divide the utilities in three, somebody else is paying for someone. So there, there are a number of changes that happen when something becomes an individually owned condo from one homeowner renting units to someone else. Uh, I am disappointed that we don't see that the fire inspector and the building inspector have gone out and looked at this house and the units to make sure that it meets safety standards, uh, today's safety standards that the city requires, and I don't understand why not. And if there is a way to request that, I would like to see that done. Well, Gregorio, I just saw you, I believe, arrive. Yes, I just connected. I'm, I apologize, I, I had some trouble uh, with my computer and connecting, but I, I went back to the uh, city website and I was able to get in. Okay, thank you. Um, are you alone in your wherever you are? I am. Yes. All right. Uh, so uh, 
Interesting comment. David, a response? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Just, just one clarification, which is that uh, this is this was not an illegal uh, three-family unit. Mr. Seguin uh, sought and obtained a variance from the zoning board, which was granted in March of 2005 for the construction of that third dwelling unit on this property. Um, I uh, I will ask him. You know, I'll, I'll leave it to Mr. Seguin or or Attorney Burke to describe what was what they went through when they got the building permit to construct that third unit. Uh, I don't know that the 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 fire code, I, I know the building code that was in effect in 2005 is not the same as it is today. I cannot speak uh, directly to the to the fire code, um, but knowing that Mr. Seguin went through the zoning process and the building permit process in 2005, um, I I would anticipate that he that there was some review by the fire department uh, and the building part department at that time, and I'll I'll leave it to to them to to discuss that further. Hi, uh, this is Mr. Siegwin. Could I chime in? Yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> In uh, response to the various concerned, uh, the uh, board member uh, raised uh, <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> the third unit that David mentioned. Yeah, you know, that went online in 2006, so that was a brand new apartment, and it met all of the uh, <clears throat> code requirements, city requirements. Uh, there was a that that apartment's on the back of the building, so it backs up to uh, the the ends of the first and second floor units, which were the original units. There was a firewall installed between those. Uh, <clears throat> that unit was completely up to code because it was a new unit. Uh, <clears throat> as, excuse me. As far as the other two units go, both of those have been upgraded. The uh, knob and tube wiring was removed several years ago. Uh, all three units have combination smoke and CO detectors and they're hardwired detectors. They're not um, with them. They do have battery backup, but they're hired, hardwired detectors. Uh, <clears throat> each unit has separate electric. Uh, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> two years ago, the electric panel for the uh, second floor unit, one of the old units, was in the mud room of the first floor unit, and I had that moved upstairs at uh, considerable expense. So, so each electrical panel is in each individual individual unit. So the units are zoned out. The units are up to code, and um, you know I'm I'm somebody who believes strongly in uh, safety, fire safety. Uh, the city and the new unit required that I put a roof over the exterior stairway, which I did. So I, you know, I, I don't um, ignore any of those responsibilities and and requirements. So, um, and, you know, I feel strongly that everything is up to code. Everything is segregated. It is true that eventually there will be three owners. Uh, I, in, I intend to work with them on, until, you know, once the units are sold and until there is a, a board in place, uh, an association in place that will manage the properties. Uh, so I will keep an eye on that as, as long as I am still involved. I'm happy to hear that, Mr. Sibgren, because there are a multitude of buildings downtown that don't meet those requirements. Uh, this is Nick Burke, if I could uh, chime in. I, I'm glad that Mr. Seguin was able to address your concerns, but I uh, would just like to remind the board that um, under the section of the ordinance, the review really is limited to uh, a determination of whether the underlying existing use of the property, which was residential, uh, whether it will be whether it will not be materially altered by the conversion. And again, after the conversion, there are going to be three separate units of, of residential 
uh, uh, rental uh, residential property. So again, it's uh, before and after we're dealing strictly with the same use, uh, residential use. Other comments from board members? Joan has her hand up. I can't see hands, but it, just speak up. Is that Joan? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, Chair Garland, I just wanted to say that um, uh, as board members, we do have our regulations in front of us, but it is also acceptable for us to ask for additional information that we that we understand may not be technically covered in the regulations, but it is completely appropriate for us to ask for any other um, questions that are relevant. And, and certainly safety questions are, are always uh, relevant just in case we happen upon something that slipped through the, the cracks, whether we're the ones who have jurisdiction or whether it's another department of the, of the city that has jurisdiction. It's just part of our thoroughness um, when we review projects to make sure we've thought of everything that could be possibly be a problem. Thank you for that. Other board members. So I would like to express my apologies, to Mr. Sager. Uh, we have a subcommittee that is looking at our rules to update them. And this is certainly one that I will urge that subcommittee to address as quickly as possible. I hope it was not our the city lawyer that drafted the language. But basically, what, and I understand the intent of the language, which is to catch any substantial changes. But what it does is require an applicant to take the time and expense to come to the board, just so the board can then determine that there isn't any change. And at that point, the board's time, the applicant's time has been wasted and the applicant's money has been wasted. And we need to find a way of having this type of uh, change notified to planning department Then could look to see if there is any change. If there is, then there would be an application. And if there isn't, there is no need to drag someone before the board at that applicant's uh, cost of time and money. This is not something that citizens should be doing to fellow citizens. And so I apologize for the time and money that you've had to spend on this. I guess, David, I need a motion from the board that we don't find any change. Uh, this is this is Tim. Uh, is this just bear in mind that the board has been deciding matters over the course of a minimum of two meetings? Um, so I, I I don't know if you want to make an exception for this application or not, but it's something to keep in mind. All right, thank you for that, Tim. Joan, I see your hand is up. Um, well, I was going to say that um, uh, I was going to address what what you had said. Oh, yes that this might might be a kind of situation that that the the proposed committee of the planning board or whatever we want to title it that's thinking about doing very minor issues and only bringing them to the board when there's something that's um, significant i mean perhaps i don't know it's just a thought yeah i i, I don't know I, I don't think this is a right time to have that debate. I think that's the subcommittee that should be looking at it. No, I, di I didn't mean to debate it. I just thought that maybe this might be an example of something that could have could go if we had a thing like that. But I also think that I remember um, the project that might have triggered this. And I'm wondering if it's the the it was a campground that had been like open just in the summer with people renting whatever however they did week to week or maybe even the whole summer um, and then decided that that they would allow year-round use and so if that's the one that triggered this i remember that and it and that that was a big difference to go from a you know used only in the summer to used year-round and it it's obvious the why that would be very good you know could be potential no i agree with that absolutely 
Yeah. The the example that that the city's attorney gave, he said explicitly was not from Lebanon. Okay. But but that was the example, and I think it's a it's an appropriate example. Um, were we to have one that did that here in here in Lebanon. So on the other hand, if you eliminated this, then you would not cover that eventuality. So it's a catch twenty two. How's that, Kathy? Pardon me. How's that? It would still come to planning staff. Planning staff would look at and and decide whether there is a significant change. If there is, then there would be an application to the board. That's different than eliminating this paragraph, though. We don't need to discuss that tonight. No, we, we won't eliminate it, but we need to change it. So, Tim, to your point, and I appreciate it, I think this is so minor we should be able to uh, decide it this evening. Does any staff or does any board member object to that? If so, may I have a motion that the board finds this does not represent a change? Councillor Winnie, so moved. Thank you, Jim. Monroe second. seconds. Monroe seconds. Uh, any discussion? So I will I will do a roll call of vote. Uh, Jim Winnie. Councillor Winnie votes aye. Kathy. I'll vote aye. Kim. Kim votes aye. I vote aye. Gregorio. I vote aye. Jerry. Jerry votes aye. And Joan. Joan votes yes. And we are unanimous. Thank you to the applicant. Thanks for participating. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. All right, we now move to an interesting application, which is City of Lebanon and Ruth Guernsey Trust. Uh, Tim, would you please introduce this unusual one? Well, I believe we have uh, Erica Brittner from the Department of Public Works. Oh, excellent. This evening. Good yes. evening, Erica. Would I'm you here. please introduce, introduce this? Yep, absolutely. Uh, so the the property owner um, had contacted us, offering us a kind of a, a land swap deal. So that's how the whole project had started moving along. Um, as a land swap, they give us this piece of property as a turnaround, and we cut off the end of our road um, that actually was never being used as a road it's just lawn area uh, when we went through and the lawyers completed all the paperwork and title search they found out we actually don't own the land under our road <laughs> um, just based off of the way the um, subdivision was originally set up the underlying land is owned by um, well, we, we don't actually know who owns it but it's owned by the original subdivider <laughs> So I'm not sure anyone will actually ever be able to claim it, but uh, we don't own it. So uh, we went back, we talked to the property owner about it, and he said, that's fine. Just if you guys give it up, just so it's not right of way, I'll still give you um, that property for your, for a turnaround. So that's the part we're moving forward with. We're asking to, um, to uh, go back to what we had done before and forget about that and then move forward. Um, with this new <laughs> new dedication. Comments from Tim. Chair, can I ask a question first? This is Kathy. I sure, need to Kathy. know whether I'm not sure whether I need to recuse myself or not. When this was originally decided last year, Laurel and I did not recuse ourselves because the notices were not being sent to a butters properly. That address change has subsequently been corrected but if you look at the map that parcel that ends in 5800 way at the top not the subject property but it is part of the open space belonging to the falls community i think it's the one behind the ball field where the trails start and since i'm president of the homeowners association in the falls i just don't i mean that parcel has nothing to do with 
this end of it, but I just need some guidance here. We did we did vote on it originally, but that's because we didn't get a notice as in the butter and didn't realize that that parcel was part of our community last year. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, I'm not sure you need to recuse this. Seems a long way away, but David or Tim? Uh, David, go ahead. I, yeah, I was. I would say solely out of an abundance of caution, uh, it might be best to recuse but, yourself from this one. Th may I ask a question first? No, no, never mind. It's it's something else. Yeah. It, yeah, again, I, I, I don't think for one moment that you have any kind of interest or, or prejudgment in this case, but solely out of an abundance of caution. There's no there's no point in jeopardizing the decision for any reason. Okay. I don't think we would want to see it a third time. <laughs> so thank you for bringing that up. I think All right, Tim, any, what, what do you have as follow on? The, the, the only thing I'd, I'd like to point out, um, Mr. Chair, is the motion, if there is one this evening, and again, I, I, I suppose that the same issue applies here and that uh, the board has been deciding applications while it's meeting online over a course of minimum two, a minimum of two meetings. Um, but to, to the extent the board um, makes a motion tonight or at a later meeting, um, that motion would be uh, is essentially set forth on page two of the staff memo under application overview. And uh, as Erica as Erica explained, there are two actions for the board uh, to, to take with respect to this matter. One is to revoke the boundary line adjustment that that it, that it approved um, last year, and the second is to approve the creation as a public street, uh, the plus or minus 2,430 square foot area identified uh, as parcel B on the uh, on the on the on the plat, um, and, uh, and and just just a final note that the planning board uh, does not have any role to play uh, with respect to the proposed discontinuance of the. Um, uh, approximately 3,350 square feet of unimproved area of Spring Street West, which is identified as parcel A on the subject plat. So, I mean, I, it seems to me that if we were to revoke tonight, but then continue to another meeting for the approval of Oak Street, that that would give any abutter the opportunity to speak to this. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, David. I, I, I may have missed it, but I uh, think there's a completeness step to, to undertake as, on this on one this as well. I, I didn't, David, I is, didn't, I, is there not? I didn't think, I didn't think there would be. I don't okay. think there is a completeness step. Okay. I said this was an unusual application. So uh, comments from board members? Does anybody object to our voting on the revoking this evening and then continuing the second part to another meeting, which will only take two minutes, but will still have to be done? All right, can I have a motion to revoke then? So moved by Monroe. Thank you, Joan. And a second. Seconded by Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Any discussion? So I, I just wanted to clarify to make sure that because it was our, our comment, our, our packet was a little bit confusing. So tonight we're, we're sort of undoing the boundary line adjustment that we had done. Correct. So we get and that out of the way, Joan. Okay. And, and then, then we'll at the next Continue meeting to another no. meeting to give the public should anyone want to uh, attend and then hopefully we can do that very quickly okay okay um any further discussion questions all right i will take a call now this is just the revoking so i will start with someone who was uh, part of this before Joan. Um, 
I vote uh, yes. Jim? On the motion. Councilor Wayne votes aye. Uh, Kim? Kim votes aye. I just realized I made another mistake, but I'll correct it in a second. I vote aye, and I made a mistake, I, uh, partly because Gregorio came in late. I forgot to appoint him to fill uh, the vacancy we have. So I'm doing that retroactively to his last vote. And to this vote, uh, Gregorio. Gregorio votes aye. And Jerry. Jerry votes aye. So that is unanimous plus one recused. Um, and David, until when should we continue this? You would continue until the 28th. Monroe? Yes, Monroe John. Make, makes a motion to continue the application by City of Lebanon and Ruth Guernsey Trust to um, what month are we in? September 28th, 6.30. Yeah, can I have a second? Jerry? All right. Um, I'll start with Kim this time. Kim, in favor? Yes, yes. Uh, I am in favor, Gregorio. Yes, I'm in, uh, Gregorio is in favor. Jerry? Jerry votes aye. Joan? Joan votes yes. And Jim? Council, any votes aye? So we are unanimous with uh, one uh, recused. All right, those are our new applications. Uh, we have no uh, new applications for completeness review only. Uh, so uh, what I would like to do is skip item five for the moment because that's internal and go to our conceptual review of William G. Neeson. And uh, is there someone from the applicant? I'm sorry, I can't see who is in attendance. So Dan, are you here? Representing the applicant? Or is the applicant here? Well, I don't hear from either of them, so I'm just going to put that to the side for the moment and we'll see maybe they were intending to uh, log in later, knowing uh, that we had a review of CIP to do. Chair, um, yep. can I ask a question about this first? Sure, please. In looking at the plot plan? Yes. To the southeast of these three lots, there's a parcel numbered 125-19 and then on the lower left corner across the road behind those parcels is another parcel with the same lot number which is confusing me i i don't see how there could be two with the same number that that must be a mistake to be corrected okay all right, would you please and, and hold we don't that. know which one is which because they would be it would be sequential no matter which one it was. Yeah, good catch, Kathy. So would you please hold that until we hear from the applicant? All right, moving on. Uh, so other business, we have the capital improvement program. Um, unfortunately, uh, we only had three members of the planning board subcommittee um, and two of them, well, one is resigned and the other one is absent tonight. So you're going to hear comments and other testimony from only one who is me. <laughs> uh, 
David, perhaps you could give an introduction. Sure. <clears throat> On August 13th and August 20th, the CIP subcommittee of the planning board met to review and discuss projects from the 20, the proposed 2021 through 2026 capital improvements program. Um, I think most of you are aware that there is a uh, a CIP policy and procedures document that the planning board updated last year, uh, which sets out what is defined as a capital improvement project item as opposed to an other capital expenditure. Um, I can go through that definition, but uh, it, suffice it to say there were there are 31 applications, 31 projects. Uh, in this year's CIP that meet the definition of a capital improvement program item. And the board, as I said, over the course of the two days, the board reviewed those 31 projects with the different boards and committees. Uh, I'm sorry, with the different departments and department heads um, discussing library, airport, fire, police, recreation, planning and public works projects. Um, the subcommittee reviewed all of those projects that met the definition, regardless of what year projects are proposed for funding. It is a six year CIP based on statutory guidance. Uh, however, for the first time this year, the CIP list includes projects that are anticipated for funding beyond the immediate six year time period. Um, uh, the reason to do that is to improve the usefulness of the CIP as a planning tool. Uh, again, the part of one of the one of the primary reasons, one of the primary purposes of the capital improvement program is to um, provide a long range perspective and framework for addressing capital improvement needs of the community. It is uh, it provides a mechanism for anticipating those future facility and improvement infrastructure requirements and ensuring that they get funded in a responsible and systematic fashion. Um, the city manager this year has made a recommendation to the city council that in an effort to begin to level off funding uh, relative to our capital improvement needs, uh, his, his goal is to not incur new general fund supported debt beyond the the amount of uh, principal debt that will be retired over the next six years and so for that reason um, the city anticipates retiring about 20.7 million dollars in general fund supported debt over the next six years and so we have we have laid out or he has laid out the administration has um, identified projects over the course of the next six years that would be funded with general fund supported debt um, with that $20.7 million in mind. However, um, Lebanon, like a lot of communities, has more infrastructure and facility needs than $20.7 million will pay for. And so for that reason, this year, um, unlike prior years, we've included what we're calling um, affectionately known as the parking lot, which represents projects where funding is anticipated in 2027 or sometime after that as funds allow and as priorities um, dictate. So that is new this year. Again, the, in the in the staff memo of August 26th, I laid out the 31 different projects that the subcommittee reviewed and the minutes reflect the discussion and and sort of a generic description of those projects uh, as presented to the CIP subcommittee. And I will as as the, the, the one other point to note is that for the this year again as as we did last year for the first time in a while we we the subcommittee scored each project based on a set of criteria that was developed by the planning board and the planning department as part of the responsibility to um, rank the, the priority and need for each project. 
And so the scoring is attached to the end of the packet for tonight. Um, but that's only part of the story. That only indicates, um, I mean, that that indicates uh, which projects scored highest. And 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 one of the one of the key components of the scoring this year was uh, the 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 need whether whether the project addressed an emergency or public safety need. Um, and we tried to set the scoring so that that, you know, if it was an emergency, if it was urgent, then the scoring should reflect that. And those projects naturally rose to the top in, in terms of the scoring. Um, it wasn't quite so cut and dry last year. Um, I will I, I, I will happily answer any questions I can about the projects that were reviewed and I'll ask Bruce as the as the sole member present tonight uh, if he wishes to add any additional information to uh, to this brief overview. Thank you, David. Um, so first of all, I would say this is a really, really interesting exercise and I highly recommend all members to think about joining this subcommittee next year. It gives you two opportunities. One, to see where the finances of the city are going with each of these projects. And one, to hear from each of virtually all of the city managers. It's just a parade of all the people that are running the city and it gives everyone on the subcommittee a wonderful opportunity to get to know up close how the city is being managed. Um, in theory, this is required by law. Uh, in theory, um, it should also sort of bubble up from the master plan, but we don't have groups of citizens that are um, implementing the master plan. So all of the projects come from the department heads, which is sort of natural. Um, as to scoring them, uh, the, the other thing I should say is that um, the information we got from the school board is very summary, um, but at least it splits out those projects. And I think there are two of them that the school board will have to get approval from citizens in a vote. Um, so it puts them in a, a different category. But again, if you're trying to look at the city's finances and the impact on taxes, you do have a pretty good idea of um, the pressures on uh, that subject from both the school board and from the city administration. Um, as to ranking, this is an issue that we have every year. And I'll give you an example. We have in, in the 31 projects, we have one from Rebecca Owens for bicycle and pedestrian, which is $45,000 to hire a consultant. And then we have one from the fire department for 15 or two from the fire department adding up to $15 million. How anyone can compare those two uh, in any meaningful manner, I don't know. So I, I tend to uh, as you hear in my voice, uh, be a little skeptical as to the usefulness of that ranking. Um, the other issue I'll just point out, um, and this is a, a time pressure as much as anything else, um, there's just not a lot of time for uh, debate. And, and so I'll take the fire department as an example and, and uh, draw your attention to the minutes. Uh, the first line of the minutes, the minutes, as always, Holly does a great job. Um, the minutes read, a single st station model was studied, but it was determined that it would not serve the city adequately. Well, what happened was that I asked the fire chief some information because I don't know anything about the fire business um, other than fire trucks are big trucks and ambulances are much smaller trucks. Um, one thing that I learned is that the fire department is misnamed because 70% of their calls are for ambulances, 30% uh, is for fires. And I don't know if there are other categories that weren't uh, given to us. Um, and I had suggested that perhaps all of the fire uh, trucks could be put into one new building 
and the ambulances spread among several buildings, and he pushed back on that. Um, but it's the type of debate that time just doesn't permit. Um, I'll add to that that I phoned um, a friend who was a selectman in Plainsfield just to ask how they handle this issue. And what I did learn, and some of you may already know this, is that when a call comes in, a 911 call for an ambulance, for someone in Plainsfield, um, that call is routed to a dispatcher in Hanover. The dispatcher then determines which side of the town the person calling is located and dispatches a, an ambulance either from Lebanon or for Windsor. So this is not just a city project, this is a regional project and clearly is going to require a lot more time than people from the planning board can really get involved in. But hopefully that gives you a flavor of uh, the sort, the time that we have on these projects and also the sort of project that we're talking about. Bruce, it sounds like the city's identified a site for the West Lebanon Firehouse. He didn't specify anything. I, I, he sort of indicated that they are uh, in discussion with a consultant. Yeah, there's there are there are discussions going on, but it's it's too preliminary to to identify. So, you know, Kathy, I don't know where this process. Obviously, it goes to the city council, but then beyond that, I don't know how these projects are handled individually. This is a big, it's a lot of money. Well, and, and what happens to the existing stations? Because there are two firehouses, then do they get sold? Does the city keep them? What? No, the, I think the intention is to sell them. But this upgrade is going to cost a lot of money one way or another. One of the questions, I briefly went through all of these to, just to, to see what was being proposed. Yep. And a number of them, for example, the police facility, which they're saying is fine for 10 years, but then it will need to be expanded, apparently not on its site. And so I thought, with the way we're approving large developments in the Lebanon area now, if somebody waits 10 years to find a larger site for the police department, you know, there's not going to be any. So um, it, I wonder if the city has a list of all the parcels the city now owns and whether any of those would be appropriate in 10 years or, I mean, I, I like the idea of going out beyond six years or also just a list of the properties that the city owns. I know this year they divested themselves of a couple kind of small properties they wouldn't have any use for, but um, I think that looking farther ahead either to acquire land that will be needed or to know what land the city already owns can help with you know with a number of these proposals that's yeah, a good comment and it might have to go out 10 years or or more right then there was that park storage and maintenance building that was proposed but it doesn't say where that's going to be it just said that it used to be on spencer street I think the plan for that project is that it would be at the Civic Field in West Lebanon. Is that behind the old high school or? It's behind Seminary Hill School. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, then there's this airport TIF district that's being created and, and uh, I guess roads and things are being put in. And then it talked about development. It, does the city intend to continue to own those lots and rent them out to companies or will they be selling those lots? Uh, the preference would be for the city to continue to own those, own that land and to do ground lease. Okay. Uh, that way that the, the revenue comes in from those leases annually would go to the airport and help offset some of the uh, typical shortfall from the airport operations.
And then there's, uh, can I just keep ask, asking questions? Please, to clarify? you're on a roll, Kathy. Oh, I am, I, I did my homework. No, you did, which <laughs> usually, is awesome. Usually Joan has me beat. <laughs> no, this is really good. Yeah. <laughs> it's not um, easy stuff to read either. Oh, the cemetery um, questions. Uh, they were talking about, I've never heard of a columbarium, but um, in any case, purchasing these, Crips for a crematorium. And they're talking about rent on that. And I'm thinking, well, when somebody dies and they pay rent, you know, then all their relatives die. Like, how does somebody keep paying for that crypt for the next 50 years when there's no family member there to do it? As opposed to you usually buy a cemetery plot, you pay several thousand for it and done. I think uh, I, I would... Definitely want to defer to Patrick McCarthy from the who is the cemetery sexton uh, within the P Department of Public Works, but I think part of the purchase price goes into um, a trust fund that is used to to pay for annual upkeep of the cemeteries. And uh, I think Bruce is showing a, a picture of the columbarium there. I don't know if you can see his screen. It's a uh, it's sort of a, a large single monument. Mailbox. <laughs> <It's a> mail. <laughs> uh, not I'm unlike sorry. that, I suppose. <laughs> um, so yes, that's that's part of where the revenue comes from is from the, is from the trust, and I I think I'm saying that properly, describing that properly. Well, I, I would think that the city would want to look into that rather than spending sixty five thousand dollars and then finding out that you know after three years nobody was paying their rent. Um, and then an, another important question is the Mechanic Street, um, Slayton Hill Road intersection, and particularly with reference to the um, overpass, underpass um, that goes up to Alice Peck Day. There was some mention in there about raising the height of that um, overpass, whatever that is, stone pass through. And I was, it said for emergency vehicles, but I was wondering if it was going to be raised high enough for a bus to get through or if it was going to be widened because the problem always has been there has not been a way to get public transportation to Alice Peck Day because of that underpass. And as long as $5 million are being spent there, you know, would a little bit extra make it serviceable for public transportation? There are an awful lot of people who go to doctor's appointments there or who work at the hospital and all the offices there and then the retirement centers behind there. I, you know, I would think that getting bus transportation there would be a priority. I agree. And I know that it is, and you're absolutely right. We are, we are still several years away from, from getting into the, the details of the design of that project. Um, that was the last project that the city was successful in adding to the 10 year plan uh, to the state's 10 year plan. So the state's portion of that money is programmed for 2029. Uh, so we probably won't begin to uh, get into the preliminary design phase of that project until perhaps I think 2026. I think it's in the last year of the uh, this capital improvement uh, program this this year six of that project or okay. five actually 2025 five hundred thousand dollars monroe here is a text from the meeting says um to start design in 2025 yes construction in 2029 well since i didn't see any note in, in the minutes with regard to buses um i think it would be good to put that note in there so that when that time comes, it's not forgotten. Okay. Two more, just two more. Can, can I add on to this one, please? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it says in the minutes, uh, it would raise the bridge for emergency vehicles, but it's not saying, I mean, if it made it big enough for the any of the um, fire equipment to get through, then I that might be high enough for the bus. But I also not, think not that- wide enough, Joan. Um, well, um, I mean, would the same be true of, of fire trucks? Yeah, but, but they've got, they've got lights and sirens, a bus doesn't. 
Well, I just meant, and I'm just talking about the raise the bridge part. Um, you know, if it, I mean, it would just be easier for, if it's emergency vehicles, it's not telling us whether that's the ambulances or, you know, the fire trucks. But the other thing is that this is a question I have related to this, that my understanding is that the railroad tracks are not owned by the city. Um, they're owned by the railroad company or companies. It's who knows who that conglomerate is. And that the that we can only, like we the public with the rails to trails can only use them basically with the permission of the corporate railroad company. And that if the, if the corporate railroad company decides they wanna take them back for railroad, then they can. So I just was kind of, when I looked at this and it said raise it, I thought, I, I kind of maybe think they can't raise it because then a railroad train couldn't use it. Yeah, this this uh, section of the track has been, is first of all, it's owned by the state of New Hampshire. Okay. It was. It has been formally abandoned from okay. active rail. Okay. Uh, but you're. But you are right that the state um, still has the ability, at least with the Northern Rail Trail, and I believe with the Mascoma River Greenway, they have the ability to notify the city uh, within a fairly short amount of time, maybe 180 days, 120 wow. days, perhaps, um, that they intend to reinstate rail service. However, there are some portions of the right, rail right of way, the, the portions that pass through the tunnel here in downtown uh, and a little bit on either side is now actually owned by the city. So the state, even the state does not own a continuous stretch of rail right of way that would legitimately allow them to reinstate rail service. They would have to buy it from the city or perhaps use eminent domain to take it from the city. Um, but I, I believe the, the, the feeling is that, that through all the discussions that the city has had with businesses who, uh, whose property abut the rail, such as Timken, such as uh, Suburban Propane or Irving and, and others, uh, there has been no stated interest in using rail, uh, at least for that industrial commercial purpose. Um, and so the, the the feeling is that it, it is sufficiently remote that it's uh, it's worth considering removing that bridge. My understanding is that the bridge, even if even if uh, rail were to come back today, the size of the trains, the weight of the trains would necessitate that that bridge has to be rebuilt anyway. Even if even if the existing structure was still there, it would have to be essentially rebuilt from scratch uh, to be able to support the new trains and tr new cars. Um, therefore, again, the, the feeling of taking out that existing bridge uh, putting in something that, whether it has an arch or, or however they design it um, for ped bike purposes, would um, would be a, a a a reasonable approach to addressing that intersection. And I'm sure I'm not doing that justice. I would I would defer to Christina Hall uh, for for additional details. And again, we are still several years out from even from the preliminary design phase. Right. Uh, and so there's a lot of discussion that will be had when we, as we approach that phase. There, the other thing to throw, yeah. the other thing to throw into the mix is uh, that it might be it might be used for light rail rather than freight. It might be used for people moving. Mm -hmm. But I also know that there are some places that use the median of the interstate highways to run the light rail. It's you know, it, it's it's all up in the air and subject to, you know, three steps forward, two steps back, six steps forward, five steps back, you know. Okay, just one. My last two questions. Go ahead. Hanover Street reconstruction. Back in the olden days, uh, <laughs> before the last fire, downtown Lebanon, 
there was a street bridge over the Mascoma that kind of continued down the pedestrian mall from in front of the courthouse or city hall down past the, you know, um, Salt Hill in that area and then went across the Mascoma. And I know that w there's no intention to continue that street now because it's a walking mall. But I was wondering, I didn't see any mention about putting a pedestrian bridge to connect Hanover Street to the downtown mall. I think that would be a way to enliven business in downtown Lebanon. And I think that fits under item G, Hanover Street reconstruction, because it talks about pedestrian and biking accommodations. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, yeah, far I enough out into the future that it, it could be added as a consideration maybe? Yes, it was certainly envisioned in the downtown visioning study from 2016, that I second definitely. pedestrian bridge. Right. Um, but it's not going to be part of the first, at least the first phase of the Hanover Street reconstruction, which is going to focus on the on the specific intersection of Hanover Street and Route 120. Sometimes if you put those things in, I mean, I think this is why the longer term uh, outlook is good because you leave room for it. You know, you don't enclose something that would be the exact spot where you'd want to put it. So like a placeholder for it would be would be good. Yep. The, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, the parking area in front of where the Knights of Columbus used to be and where the I think it's a cupcake shop and others. Right. Yeah, uh, that is still city property. It's it is still part of the Hanover Street right of way. And I believe the abutments uh, for that former bridge may still be present and, and visible on the on either side of the of the river at that point. So the, the possibility is certainly still there. Yeah, because right around the corner there where that traffic circle is supposedly going, I mean, where the rail trail kind of ends, that's just a whole problem area for pedestrian and bicycle transportation there. So this should be figured into that solution at some point. Agreed. Yeah. And then lastly, uh, number K, new water supply source study. And obviously we know that right now the water, the drinking water for the city of Lebanon comes from the Mascoma River. Uh, and so an emergency second water source area uh, sounds like a good idea. And I, my, I put in my notes here, remember Flint, Michigan. I mean, a, a, a polluted second water source doesn't make sense. So I think we ought to be very careful about um, I mean, Hanover and Lebanon have their sewer plants on the Connecticut River within like two or three miles of each other. So I just think we ought to be very careful about pulling our public drinking water um, from there in, any, in anything more than an emergency uh, basis. I saw somewhere else in here where they're talking about wanting to handle more sewage at the sewer plant. So that didn't sound real palatable to me. Can, Although the idea I, of, a, of a secondary source is a good idea, I'm concerned. Can, can I, I, I? This is just a, an investigation. Joan? Oh, no, I think it's Kim. Kim. That, Kim? that was me. Um, just to kind of tack on to that question, is there a reason that Connecticut River was identified as the potential second source? I mean, apart from the obvious that it's right here. Well, my I, my I recall that there's a study that was done in maybe 2001, maybe many, many years ago now, um, where they looked at the aquifers that underlie the city and to identify which aquifers could possibly um, provide the volume that the city might need as a backup source. And the and the only one that I recall being identified as a viable source was uh, in that area of South Main Street, right along the Connecticut River. Uh, some of the other air, some of the other aquifers underlying the city would not be able to provide the volume that uh, the city would need, based on the amount of water that's that's being treated uh, today. 
So I think the the initial point um, was one of volume. Certainly, quality water quality would certainly be part of any any effort to to create that second water source. Um, and so that's again, that's as the chair said, that's part of what the study is going to be about. That's what I have. Other other comments, questions. Chair Garland, Joan here. Yes, um, Joan. I have quite a few unless someone else wants to go. No, go ahead. Okay. Gee, Joan, I think I covered half yours, didn't I? <laughs> well, we, we could debate the percentage. I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, uh, thank you, Gar Thank you, Bruce, about telling us about the fire station, that 70% of the calls are for ambulances, because that's, you know, that's an interesting number to mull around and also considering the number of projects that we've had where the fire department is saying um, they feel comfortable with a proposal because it's got sprinklers and it's got more um, fire resistant materials um, so it's interesting to think about that um, just so, going Joan, just to be clear those are the only two so i don't know if there are other categories that weren't mentioned Oh, well, your emergency. Just, I mean, but just that, like I say, 70 percent. I mean, and I know that there are certain regulations where certain types of accidents and stuff require that the fire truck go there, even though there's not any actual fire happening. But there's a potential that a fire could happen. So I know that sometimes they have to go just because they have to go. And I suspect okay. the same is true of the ambulance, too. Sometimes they have to go, even though there's not yet been a, a need for it but there the chance is high that there there could be anyway um um i the, i'll start with the most one of the most controversial ones first looking at number uh e the police facility renovation expansion um uh over the years some of us um i know you did bruce have gone some of the planners have gone to the um to the sewer plant and the, the drinking water plant and the, the sewer plant, um, you know, because that's part of the infrastructure. And I'm I'm wondering um, about the police facility because I'm thinking how it's really not all that old. I, you know, I remember what it was before and then what it became. And I, I'm thinking that um, either have a tour of it or have um, uh, I don't know with, with a virtual tour, but I remember seeing the old hospital, having sort of a tour of the old hospital, the old Dartmouth Hitchcock, Mary Hitchcock, um, before the, the new one was built and seeing all the stuff that was lining the hallways. Like you could hardly see the wall and either wall in the hallways because they had so much stuff. They were using the hallways for storage. Um, and um, so I'm curious about the police station and I'm also curious about um, what kind of equipment they have. And I'm thinking about I'm thinking about how around the country um, a lot of a lot of a lot of discussion is taking place about defunding the police, which doesn't mean giving them zero, but it means how many rubber bullets do they need to have, how much tear gas do they need to have, and how many you know big boom loud noise makers they need to have, and so I I'm a, I'm a, I'm really think it's time to shine the light on our police department and see what it has in terms of like the hard solutions to problems. And by that, I mean rubber bullets and gas, um, you know, um, pure gas. And, and how much do they have in soft solutions, meaning trained psychological people who can help when there's someone, there's a call been made and that it's not a matter of strong arming the person, but the person is in psychological distress of some sort. And considering how many soldiers now we've had go to Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran and Lebanon and all these other places, um, you know, I think lots of, you know, I, I there are a lot of things, there are lot, there's areas where I think that the, the, the police strong arm tactics is not the appropriate way to go. So I'm throwing that idea out there. I'd really like the counselors and the planners to have a tour and see some of the equipment that can't fit there. Um, then on um, on F for the community center, um, the uh, this it says that that 
that the recreation department has no indoor space and must rely on community partners, particularly the schools. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I know that might not be ideal, but on the other hand, those are like two fingers on the same hand, you know, the rec department and the schools. I mean, if they can't work together, where are we? I mean, they should be, they should be integrating. Um, and also where it says they were not possible to have a camp this summer, well, that wasn't necessarily due to space. That was due to the COVID situation. I mean, back in May, when those things would have been being finalized, we were all told, oh, well, stop, stop, stop. You can't go to the beach. You can't do this. You can't do that. Um, and so I think that's a, that's, I, you know, I'm just a little bit concerned about the somewhat grandiose. So, so I think that particular point, um, this, the school simply closed down their facility. So there wasn't an independent city facility. That was all that was being suggested. Well, well I, I would I would add, I think from our experience, the schools do a pretty good job of programming their own spaces and they don't leave a lot of time for adult leagues and uh, recreation leagues. So it's not just it's yes. not just it's not that we're not partnering with them. It's just that there's only twenty four hours in a day and that the fields need rest. Um, Again, that the we're talking about the community center here specifically, not not necessarily fields, but um, we we do do a good job. The recreation does a does a very good job partnering with the schools, um, but good there's just not enough space to go around. Okay, good to hear. Which makes me I've been racking my brain about what other kinds of places could be used, and I would like to think that that is also something that's that's being thought about. And I think about the utility right of ways that I see out in in uh, Oregon, where they basically have uh, things like soccer fields lined up. I, there's one that I go to that's that's basically on the the utility right of way, and it's like eight soccer fields in a row, and uh, they also run at night because they're right there, right next to the electricity poles. So, um, you know, I'm racking my brain about where, what kinds of places in the city we could do double duty and put in a, you know, even just one or two fields here or there. Um, and then the other um, on Spark, the parks storage and maintenance building. Um, I'm also thinking um, that we're, you know, like that there seems to be this mindset that the city needs to buy everything that it needs. And I, I, I think that, that, that maybe sometimes renting space might be a good idea. Um, some of us have said for years that, um, that brick and mortar traffic is going to be less as more of, of buying and selling of goods happens online. And I think if anything, that this pandemic has showed us that that's, there's there's a lot in that. So I'm thinking about how many buildings that exist around the city that now will be vacant. Um, because, I mean, I know some, I mean, we've had businesses go out of business because of the the, 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 um, uh, the the pandemic, but I don't know how many more businesses will go into business. So it's just a thought, you know, of vacant buildings. Um, and that where was they the are. reason, Joan, too, that I suggested that the city make a list of all the land, the vacant land or property that they own, and because maybe something like that could be utilized. Yes, but also of and we of, don't know what that is of the city in general. I mean, I mean, uh, the buildings and stuff that's not owned by the city, but sitting there for you know wanting some income, um, and some of them might work real well. I mean, you take a year out, and that buys a year a year's time um paving the um okay then we go into the playing fields i already mentioned that i won't touch the tiff um i thought the cemetery um ideas with the um i didn't know what what columbariums were either um but i, I read this and i thought well there's some potential for profit there <laughs> you know we have lots of dead people we can cash in on them um, <laughs> and if we can convince them to all you know, be, be reduced to ashes that we got a lot more space. Um, but anyway, um, the one that you showed, I don't have that report like you had, Bruce, that showed. But I know that there are places where um, the niches where the where the urns or whatever is in those niches um, 
they can, they, their buildings can be can hold a lot more urns on a much much smaller footprint. And considering that you know, was it Twain that said land they're not making it anymore? So we have to figure out how to really maximize. And the way to maximize land is always to go up. Um, maybe not as high as the trade towers. Um, and then, um, let's see, I mean, the bridges, I mean, God, the bridges are, you don't have to drive very far before you see them and pray every time you go over or under one of them. <laughs> they look so bad. Um, let's see. Um, da -dum 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 -dum. Um, and the street improvements um, this, on the um, city hall rec renovation, um, Tim and David, I sure hope you're making sure that the $86,000.30 that's project that's planned for the exterior architectural lighting will not be up. <laughs> and it will be warm light. The 3,000 lumens or whatever they are. This space for Tim and David to say, oh, absolutely, of course. Oh, absolutely, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Eighty-six thousand dollars is is not chump change. Um, I mean, in the big budget, it is. But penny here, penny there, eighty-six thousand here, eighty-six thousand there, and it's up. Um, yeah, I also noticed about the um, the water supply from the Connecticut. And is the Boston Lot Lake no longer considered a potential? Is it because it's just way too small? Because it used to be years ago. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, actually. That's a good question. It may be a volume issue there. Is that still in Lebanon? Yeah. The Boston Lot yep. Lake? And not only that, but I mean, my goodness, um, I took a lot of pictures and did a lot of work up there when the lake was drained, when the, you know, the dirt dam was breached so that work could happen. And um, when it was refilled, I mean, that water was clearly clear clean, beautiful rainwater. So, I mean, and that, there's nothing around that lake that pollutes. I, it would have to, it could only come from out of the sky if there's pollutant because there's nothing else drains into that lake. But anyway, um, maybe it would just be part. Yeah, people go swimming there. And, oh, I, you know, I do it all but, the time. But Down yeah, the wildlife I, I, corridor. I'm sure it's, you know, I'm sure it would be part of the study to uh, to assess whether or maybe if it hasn't already been oh, I hope off. it hasn't been ruled out. I hope things yeah. don't get permanently ruled out because sometimes you might need two or three smaller sources rather than just one big one. Mm -hmm. um, okay. That's, I mean, that's part of what a, a, a workshop that I went to um, years ago from one of the planning ones that was sponsored. Um, they talked about instead of having the whole country be on one electrical grid, that there be lots of smaller, uh, smaller grids that could be interlocked, but could also be separated if if need be. And um, in the same way can be true of water. You know that you don't necessarily get all your water from one place; you get it from three places. Anyway, I had a question on the septage receiving facility, and what's the difference between sludge, septage, and grease? <laughs> I will defer to Jay. Uh, Kyrelli on that one. Septage, I think, is what is pumped out of septic tanks. Oh, okay. Grease is obviously, you know, what comes from restaurants and and things. Uh, and does, sludge. That just, does that does the grease just go through the water to the treatment plant and then have to be pulled out there? No, there's usually gas and and oil and grit separators and things. I, I think it's okay. captured. Okay. Um, closer the to the source, yeah. Okay. And then sludge is sludge is the dried product that comes out of the treatment plant. Okay. Not and, so dry. And does well, all of, so dry. well almost dry. <laughs> does no, does all so of that dry. does all of that then go to our lined landfill? No. I I don't know. I I think it. I think some of it does. I, I'm not certain that all of it does. Be nice to know at, for as planners. I mean, seems to me like that. A, that's a real basic thing that I think we should know. Um, Have you toured the sewer plant, Joan? No, I haven't. Oh, it's fascinating. You know that but I'm trying to think the names of that committee. Every fall, they have like a dozen people from Lebanon who 
come in for the program. What's it called, David or Tim? You know, where Citizens uh, Academy. Cinema, Citizens Academy. Citizens Academy. I did that maybe seven, six or seven years ago. And I, I, the head of every department in the city comes and talks to you and you do a tour. Um, it, it's it's just wonderful to get to know Lebanon, how everything works. You do do the water plant and the sewer plant and the uh, the landfill. And um, it, I'm trying to think of other places we went. Um, you find out what the city clerk does in the planning department. And the we oh, you said tour in the police department. That was part of. It as oh, well. it was? Yes. Well, I think maybe this is definitely something that our planning board should consider. Perhaps, I mean, we've got a lot of new people now, and unfortunately we've lost, you know, like uh, we've lost a couple more. And so we have some brand new people. And so I think, you know, to the tune of, you know, maybe once every two years, maybe, uh, that the planning department could, and this is a question, um, arrange to have, to have a number less than a quorum go and see these places. Um, I think it's important. What I had in the past was someone from the from the waste department come and talk to us and someone from the water department come and talk to us being the planning board. But I think that um, going to see it, I think, you know, is much Amazing. more. Yeah, it is much more effective, I think. And also um, and looking at the landfill. Um, um, expansion and disposal capacity to 2090. Um, I know that there's been a lot of talk over the years that it was thought that if Lebanon had a large landfill and it could be the regional landfill that we could actually make money by accepting trash. And I wonder if that idea is still out there and, you know, is that concept being looked at? And also I know that when I was talking about um, Recycling recently, Laurel, who I was hoping would be here tonight, and she's absent tonight, but she right away said, hey, wait, wait, the whole idea of trash and and, and recycling, she said, in, in Concord, we've been talking about it, that, and so she said, big changes are coming, but, you know, she didn't have time to, to tell us, so that's something that I'm, I'm wondering about, because I see the phase three, four design, I see the phase three construction, I see the gas collection and control, I see the PFAS, um, study. I see the landfill property acquisition, and then I see the gas to energy project. So, um, and I know that that Mark Morgan has been good. Um, he was very progressive in a lot of his ideas, and I hope that we are that we're still allowing him to continue to bring new ideas and and pursue them. Um, that we haven't given given up about any of these things. Uh, you know how we can reduce the. Um, how we, we can do we can reduce everything, you know, from low flow toilets to um, things that are biodegradable rather than poisonous, and that's the PFAS idea. And I wanted to um, I always forget where the camera is. Oh, here we go. This is a really excellent book, and maybe it's backwards um, on the camera, but it's called Cradle to Cradle, and it was it published about ten years ago, and it basically explains that. For sustainability and to save the planet, one of the things we need to do is to stop making things out of deathly toxic materials. We've all we've all learned the bad stuff about plastic, and be I forget what they are the, the things that are in plastic that we're not supposed to drink, um, and that also speaks to the to the landfill, and that also gets me around to the construction debris. When I see the construction debris, the small amount that has come out of our house, it's just horrifying to think that that stuff is not being utilized in any way. And and one reason is because economically it can't be used in another way. And so it just goes and fills up a hole in the ground. Windows and things that are that are perfectly good and perfectly used, um, boards that are perfectly good, that just have a couple of nails and just, it's just, that can't use it, throw it out. Well, you know, we can't keep thinking like that. If we want to become green and the wildfires, wildfires out west are showing me, and I hope they're showing a lot of other people, that climate change is real and it has accelerated. And this whole pandemic has accelerated. Um, I didn't expect to see this pandemic until 10 or 15, 20 years after I was gone. And I'm shocked that it, it has happened while I'm still alive. And um, I think that all, all of the aspects of green stuff really needs to get put on the, on the front burner, pun intended. Well, you know, like to say something, Kathy. 
Yeah, I was along that same lines and, and the pandemic has changed a lot of things because people don't want to take things that are other people's now and don't want right. to go into people's houses and get things. But in a normal year, uh, when you're doing renovations, both the Listen Center and the cover store accept old kitchen cabinets and working appliance. A lot of people are like putting in stainless steel appliances, but they're black or white or beige appliances work perfectly well. They'll take them and then someone else will buy them. And then that gives them money to renovate and put in wheelchair ramps and do some weatherization in other people's houses. And there's that very interesting salvage store in that big brick building across the tracks from White the Hartford train station in White, White River. Um, and they have all these things like um, clawfoot tubs and old windows and, and architectural pieces from older. So you don't have to throw everything away. There are a lot of places around this area that um, that will put them to reuse. Un unfortunately, we're the kind of people that we don't get rid of something and it is until it is completely, absolutely, undeniably beyond a shadow of a doubt dead. <laughs> and so I did try in lots of those places and they all rejected what I had. And I also checked with our electrician. I checked That's with our plumber. That's a humbling experience. <laughs> I checked with our electrician, our plumber. Um, and I, I personally ended up taking like light fixtures, taking them apart so I can deposit metal at the dump and glass in the glass. And so it's just a whole concept that we need to we need to work on. Um, uh, the last things get the last three things on our list, um, the landfill gas to energy. Um, this one is another one that's a potential profit maker. And I know that the Energy Committee is trying very hard and working very hard to deal with all of the hoops and and uh, jumps that that have needed to be crossed over and worked through and negotiated to get it going. I mean, like it started how many years ago? And then that company that was going to do this went belly up. Um, and I mean, and that's a potential profit maker. So, you know, to me, that's something that should be on the top of the list. And it's actually number, it's the last one. It's landfill. Well, well, Joan, Joan, I was, I was going to mention it because if you look at it, you'll see it's not been scored. And the reason oh, okay. it hasn't been scored is that this is an issue that Liberty Utilities has raised recently. And an oops. initial estimate of the cost would be a million dollars. And if that comes in at a million dollars, there's no way that the project would be profitable and therefore the city wouldn't go ahead with it. Right. So that's the but, reason it's not scored. And, and like I said, having heard about it uh, from my time on the Energy Committee, which is since like November, they have just been presented with all kinds of just horrible and disgusting and ridiculous hoops that have needed to be gotten through. And it's just, it's, it's just, it's mind boggling that I, I, you know, thank God we have people like Tad Montgomery and Clifton Below working on it because just as fast as they manage to come up with some kind of a creative solution, another hoop is put in front of them and it's just terrible. And then the climate action plan. And wasn't the climate action plan listed at $100,000? And let me see. Yeah. Yes. And I forget where that is on here. Oh, that's the next to the last one. And and when you read the climate action plan, um, well, it says the goal of the plan is to set realistic, short and medium term interim targets and identify the most important and feasible actions and priorities to set Lebanon on track for achieving its long term climate goals. In my mind, that should have been number one. But OK, that's an opinion. I've been trying to give you a smattering of you have to join the committee, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm in the I'm in in the Energy Committee and working there. Um, and then the uh, the complete streets. The second paragraph of the complete streets says, well, for one, complete streets is, you know, to make it so that people can walk and they can bike and they can roller skate and, and be safe and be willing to do it and cross country ski in the winter. And then the very and the end of the second paragraph, it says this will help local boards when working with applicants on development projects, as well as preparation of the city's capital projects, et cetera. 
and that one is second to the last. So that is a mystery to me. And I'm done. Soapbox is put aside. I'm ready to. All right. Thank you, Joan. Listen. I any have one other question. Any, any other committee members? Kim, I, go ahead. I have a couple questions. Yes, Kim. Um, Joan and Kathy, you did such a great job asking questions. <laughs> I have <laughs> almost none, so I'll try to be very fast here. A couple of the questions I have are more general, um, but sticking with the climate action plan, I wasn't clear if the climate action plan would be rolled into all of these other requests, which to me, with few ex exceptions, most of them I didn't notice that there was um, any particular call out to um, trying to keep the the whatever the the item green. So, for example, with regards to the um, fire stations and the and the police department and even the city hall renovations. It is there. Is there a green plan somewhere that already exists, or is that considered in each of these items? Is it considered in any of these items? I would say it's considered in each item. Um, certainly, the projects that apply that are that are subject to the building code. Um, there is an energy conservation component to the building codes uh, now, and so there's there is inherently for any facility that's going to get built, uh, there is that green component um, that, that is part of that project. Uh, I think the city through some of its city councilors and uh, certainly city manager as well have made it a point to seek energy efficiency, um, certainly in the in the city hall renovation and, and other improvements, uh, the library improvements, some, some work to the police station in the last several years, M much of that is, is being done with an eye towards energy conservation. The Public Works Department started a facilities assessment plan. Um, this is an, yet another project that was, that was funded in part last year where they're gonna, they're gonna take a look at a handful of, of buildings figure out what those facilities are and how they function, and then look for opportunities to make those kinds of retrofits and, and upgrades. Uh, it's not currently listed in the uh, in this six year window because I think the plan is it's it's it is listed on the plan, but the funding is proposed for for the parking lot, quote unquote, um, because the goal is to is to to continue to work and, and implement the, the, the kinds of changes and recommendations that were identified in the first round before we can before we do the next round of buildings, the next set of buildings. Uh, so yes, I would say there is there is definitely um, there's a green component to, to almost all of these projects, certainly the facilities but, projects. So is there any sort of a set standard that renovations and or new builds have to meet or are attempting to meet or is it if we can make it work we will no as i said there's you know the, the facilities projects are subject to the building codes there is an energy conservation com code uh that is that is one of the one of the compendium of the international building code codes. Right. Yeah. Um, so that obviously that's a that's a minimum. That's a floor. So we have to meet that. But there's nothing like lead certified or anything like that. No, the the city hasn't identified any lead or green building code or any other above code standard uh, that it that it is targeting. I know that uh, several of the city councilors have expressed a desire to have the city consider adopting more advanced codes more quickly okay. because the state building code gets adopted every six or eight years and there are multi the, the the ICC codes come out every three years and they have routinely skipped 
uh, one or more of those iterations of, of new codes. So I know that Councillor Bilo and Councillor Hill and Councillor Sykes, among among others, uh, expressed an interest in investigating the pros and cons and, and what would it take for the city to to adopt those those newer codes sooner than the state does. Uh, but again, yes, talked about even, it. In the energy committee. The energy committee yeah, has talked about that. Also. Even the, even that is not sort of an above code uh, requirement like a green building code or, or, or any of the others. One of the problems that is engendered by something like that as um, what's the best word here? Laudable as as a code like that is, is when you look at the existing standard of buildings, 150 year old buildings in Lebanon, they are so far below the lowest code to require someone who's doing something new to build 80 million times better isn't fair when the house next door doesn't have to do anything. And it's it's very, very difficult um, to get any avenue into even safety concerns for some of the existing buildings. There is just the way things stand now, there is no way to make people have their uh, particularly multifamily homes safe unless they change the use. And then you have to build the Taj Mahal. So it, it's very um, uneven. So I would be hesitant to put more exacting codes uh, on some projects while not having anything required of the majority of others. Yeah, I, 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 I understand what you're saying. I think what I was getting at is, you know, I'm looking through a lot of these anticipated renovations and it seems to me that the city should consider in each one of these renovations attempting to make them as green as possible and I'm not sure if there is a standard that could or should be set you mentioned Kathy lead certifications of um, you know potentially a certain level I know that yeah, in order to be at the even the base level of lead certified can be very costly, mm -hmm. but I you know the long term long term I think if the city is looking at these buildings with a hundred year plan, so to say, then becoming lead certified is something that makes economic sense, and and it seems to me that given the times we're in, it makes sense that the city of Lebanon is considering that in each and every renovation or new build project that they're putting on the table. Isn't, so, isn't the West Lebanon Library, this is a question for David and Tim, isn't the, isn't the West Lebanon New Library, the Kilton, isn't that one LEED certified? I thought it was. I think it is. I, I'm not sure what level. I think right. it is too. Yeah. But but even if if it's not an official lead certification, if it had a lot of the components that lead buildings have, that would be good. Because I understand with the certification, there has, you have to apply, you have to yeah. like apply to the program, and and there's a little bit of money lost just in getting that certification that could have gone to even more green things. It's right. always, always yeah. easier to do with new construction than in a, a rehab, always. Yeah, absolutely, yep. yeah. Um, if A uh, couple other questions that I had. Uh, another question that was more general is um, kind of going, I think, for what Kathy was asking, too. I was wondering if there is some sort of a long-term plan that exists for all of Lebanon city owned parcels and or buildings. Um, and, and really what I, why part of why I'm wondering leads into a, a couple detailed questions. Um, uh, even looking at the police station renovation, um, you know, saying that it's, it, it needs to be a larger size, 
I'm, I'm wondering if there are alternative um, buildings that the city of Lebanon might own that maybe are underutilized that could potentially serve as storage or I, I, I'm, I'm just not sure. I, I look at this plan and, I, and granted, I have been on the planning board for, I think, maybe a month, maybe less <laughs> than that. So I, I will fully admit I'm not as knowledgeable as most people sitting at the table, but I'm trying to mm -hmm. figure out how I can really get a grasp on what's in front of me without really understanding what it is that that is sitting vacant is underutilized is just v vacant land who would be what the person alternatives to make that there are. list who would make that list david um public works in all likelihood uh different departments i mean public works is the they own the bulk of properties um and own and manage or manage let's say um but rec has some I guess some facilities, um, library, certainly police, fire, each have their own facilities. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the public works department is working on a, a facilities assessment plan. And again, the goal is to evaluate each of our existing facilities to get a sense of what condition it's in, what kinds of improvements are necessary and you know when when should those improvements be worked on you know when are they going to reach the their their useful life and, and need to be upgraded whether it's the roof the lighting what have you uh, the other piece that public works is currently working on is the asset management program and that is even more comprehensive so that's going to look at all of the individual buildings coming out of the facilities assessment plan but it's also going to look at every single road, every single sidewalk, every section of, of water pipe, sewer pipe, drainage pipe, valves, hydrants, street lights, everything that the city is responsible for. And they're they're putting it, they're they're putting it all into this massive database uh, program that can help manage and track when we upsize a culvert. It, it spits out job. Uh, job orders and, and you can Just put in the, the new data yeah. yeah put in the put in the data for inverts and and uh, diameters and and everything to do with the culvert when one gets replaced so all of that information is being compiled into this asset management program um, so those two things will have through those two things, we will get a very, very comprehensive look at at everything that the city's responsible for. In terms of properties themselves, um, it wouldn't be that difficult. I mean, you could do you could search through the city's online GIS for City of Lebanon as the owner, and you could get a list of all of the properties uh, that the, that the city currently owns. Uh, some of them, you know, obviously, some of them are active city facilities. Some may have been uh, acquired for conservation purposes. Some may have been um, taken for through tax deed uh, purposes. You know, so David. I, I, I just one, one one last comment. I know that I know that the conservation commission um, has reviewed that list periodically to see if any of the properties that the city has uh, that we might get for whatever reason have conservation value. And that's certainly one of the one of the questions that gets asked when there's um, a request to deem a, a piece of property a surplus property. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it, it is it's uh, there's various uh, departments that would be responsible and, and would have input to the process of evaluating every piece of property that the city currently has uh, for the purpose of seeing if, if it has value to the city's current operations. I know that the Recreation Department has done that with respect to searching for field space or community center space. I am very certain that the police and fire departments have done that with respect to you know, seeking potential alternative locations for their for their facilities. 
um, in an effort to keep the cost down, uh, if for, no, for nothing else. Um, I'm pretty sure that the Brenz, Lavallee Brenzinger study that, that, that looked at all three of the public safety facilities um, determined that the police department property is large enough to accommodate the expansions that they will need for the foreseeable future. But that was not the case with either of the fire department facilities. And, that, and so for that reason, the fire department has been looking for additional uh, or, or alternative parcels. So one property that comes to mind in terms of a vacant property owned by the city is the one in West Lebanon that was so controversial that we rezoned last year. The one that had that old house on, on the hill on the corner of Seminary Hill and 12A and the only reason that we were convinced to rezone it is because the recreation department was going to rehab it and use it for their offices because they were being kicked out of city hall. And then like a month later, the city demolishes it, takes it down. And now we have this prime location on the other side of 12A that's zoned central business district, which we would never have rezoned that way if it hadn't been to give the city recreation department a place to locate. And so my question is, can we rezone that back to what it was? And what would it take to do that? It would take city council action. Why city council? Because they're in charge of the zoning ordinance and the zoning map. But we were the ones that had to approve it. No, the city council had to approve it. We we designed it. Then they yeah, approved you, it. You commented well, to the city council on the proposal, on the administration's proposal. I, I just think that's a slap in the face to West Lebanon. I really think putting that as CBD with no, like with all the lack of requirements that central business district lots have, um, that seemed kind of underhanded to me. And when, when, when they immediately tore that down for whatever valid reasons they tore it down, it was, it was very disappointing. Yeah. So I know that when they, yeah, I, I know that when they got into renovating that building, it was determined to be too far gone. Um, so they demoed it when the city did its West Lebanon village visioning charrette last fall that was obviously that was a key parcel of the southern gateway that was looked at the the visioning charrette process identified that as as possible location for a pocket park or or sort of a, a, a an entry green space entering west lebanon village in the main street area when the when the final report for the visioning charrette was presented to the council in April. Um, not every councilor weighed in, but those that did thought that I think the West Lebanon, uh, the Westboro Yard, basically ac almost literally across the street, uh, would be a better location for green space and that the parcel there at, at uh, the corner of Elm Street West and Seminary Hill and, and South Main Street could be uh, redeveloped and it's certainly possible that in conveying the property to anyone uh, the city can put because we're the owners we can put whatever development restrictions we want onto it i would hate to see someone come through with a 45 foot high building taking up the entire parcel i mean i it would just be a travesty i i just think that was such a mistake for us to do that i wish we would have known in advance the condition of that building and they wouldn't have needed it. Yeah, I don't think anybody did know the condition and then of the building. The other thing is Rhymes has been sold to a non-American United States company. So now we have a Canadian company with its explosive fuel yard in the, you know, behind Main Street in West Lebanon. I mean, it's just like it's really hard to be a positive West Lebanon resident with every single time you turn around there's something that's being done to that village that's unfortunate. It, it just, I mean, how, how can we give a 25 year lease to a Canadian company that keeps us from building anything in downtown Lebanon because we're in so many feet of an explosive fuel facility? I mean, it just, it, 
don't get me started. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try and can, talk. <laughs> can I, can I, particularly with your uh, objections to Canadians. Um, <laughs> we'll come back to our list of, of projects and try and wrap this up. I do have three names that I will keep in mind for subcommittee members next year. This is very helpful. I know. Anyone <laughs> else on the board who would like to opine on these? Can I can I just finish with one final question? I'm yes, sorry, I'll, sir, I'll, sir, I'll make it quick, but it um, sort of speaks speaks also to what Kathy was just saying. That I, w I wasn't clear why um, Station Two seems to have been picked to be replaced first, and if. The replacement of that station, if someone is anticipating rolling that into the discussions centered around the redevelopment of West Lebanon. Uh, I believe that property, as opposed to the downtown station one, um, that is the most constricted site in terms of the city's operation. Yeah. The, the the property that the that the city owns is almost is almost limited to the footprint of the building. There right. is no parking. Uh, the, the 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 personnel that work out of Station Two are actually park on the Ledyard Bank property uh, out of the graciousness of Ledyard Bank. There is no parking on that property. Uh, the trucks. Um, I think it's true that the size he, that the chief mentioned that one of the stations, and I think it was station two, they the overhead doors are not large enough to handle standard um, ladder trucks. And so they have to buy custom equipment to fit in right. that station, uh, which is just elevates the cost of, of the of the equipment that the city needs to to acquire for its purposes. Um, so I think that is the reason why station two is identified as as sort of the higher priority uh, of the two facilities. The <clears throat> the um, according to the notes, it's station one that has the door that's not high enough station one. OK. Yep. I'm, it I'm sorry, sense. I misspoke. It's, it's yeah. older. It probably yeah, it's older. And so, but but yes, you're right. The uh, another component of the West Lebanon visioning charrette process was to try to take that intersection of Tracy Street and Main Street, where you've are, where you've got the fire station, you've got Kilton Library, you've got a couple of banks there, you've got the former library, um, and make that sort of uh, the heart of the village through some streetscaping improvements. And it was noted in the visioning charrette. It was it was understood at the time that the public safety facility study was already underway, and that if the if the study identified that the the, uh, the department's long term operations could not be accommodated on that piece of land, then it might be then that land could become available for redevelopment for sale and redevelopment, which was very much um, a consideration. Uh, of the West Lebanon envisioning charrette study because it wasn't, I mean, certainly we didn't know and we don't know who, who it might, who might purchase it or, or what they might do with it. But the idea of repurposing fire stations has, has, uh, has been around. Um, uh, lots of communities have done that around the country in terms of repurposing those facilities for all kinds of creative uses. Uh, so that's that's very much a possibility. Hanover's became their city hall. I've Hanover's seen restaurants. Life. I've seen art studios. I've seen all yeah, kinds of things. Turned it into a restaurant. That makes sense. So do we do we have comments or questions from other board members? I want to make sure that other people have had their opportunity. <laughs> Dave, David, I know you had a draft motion. Yes, I, I apologize. It, it occurred to me after the fact, after the subcommittee completed its work on that second late night, um, that I failed to have the subcommittee make a recommendation of its own to the full board. Uh, but for this year, we'll go ahead and skip that for the moment. And I will 
share a uh, a potential draft and this uh, of, of a motion for the full planning board to consider whether relative to uh, approving and adopting the capital improvement program for this six year period. Um, and I will say that the second sentence of this motion uh, reflects the fact that the city manager would like to have the planning board take an even larger role in the uh, the, the preparation and review and promotion of the capital improvement program. Uh, it really is a, a planning board document the way the city does it. It's, it's not done that way in every community, but uh, in Lebanon it is a planning board document um, that looks at the six year planning horizon of, of capital needs and, and facility improvements and things. Um, and only the only the first year of it goes to the city council normally uh, as part of the capital budget recommendation. Um, but it is a very important tool for the, for the city. And so I think the city manager anticipates uh, that the that the planning board will play uh, an increasingly large role in creating that every year in in reviewing it and keeping it updated and and promoting it going forward. So can you see this? Can you see the screen? The motion? Can you here? enlarge it? I sure can. How's that look? Good. Can I ask just one last question? Is that Kathy? Yes. Okay. It has to do with number eight, landfill property acquisition. Um, it's, they seem to have identified two lots on Plainfield Road that would be, I guess, adjacent to the current landfill and the likely expansion area. Why is that not being bought now as opposed to waiting? Is that under contract? Uh, the, the, the money that is specified in the CIP there is for uh, environmental site assessment work to study it. To, so that we know what we're we we would know what we're buying, uh, that is not the purchase price. Um, okay. The purchase would be negotiated at some point after that th that work is completed. Do you have some sort of agreement where it won't be sold to anyone else? That you have some sort of right of first refusal or something like that? Um, no, and that's there, there's a chance that is could become an issue. I heard I, I heard a comment um, about that, so it, it may very well be something that uh, comes off the table for exactly that reason. I, I, I would think you would want to tie it up if you were wanting it, but anyway. Joan, may I turn to you and ask that you read this motion? Sure. You ready? Yep. Um, Joan Monroe moves that the planning board approves and adopts the capital improvement program for the six year period 2021 to 2026 as presented in the September 14, 2020 agenda packet and hereby submits year one 2021 of the CIP as the board's recommendation to the city council for capital budget funding for 2021. The planning board also wishes to acknowledge and highlight the importance of the CIP program and process as an essential component of the city's overall financial planning effort and as a mechanism for anticipating future facility and infrastructure requirements in order to ensure that they are funded in a responsible and systematic function. Thank you. May I have a second, please? Yeah, may I ask a question before we, before we go to the vote I can wait until yes. I can. usually we need a second and then we can discuss it then we can discuss it I was going to say well I'm happy to second it thank you. all right thank you Jerry and so your question, question yeah it's a little late I realize that but my question is this the scoring system that is uh, an important part it seems to me of this uh, of this document that we've been talking about um it's it's possible to try and figure out how it works, but it would be nice to have a and maybe I just missed where it's discussed at some point, but I don't quite understand uh, all the um, uh, what can I say all the elements 
from the uh, uh, very abbreviated descriptions of them at the top of every column. And, uh, you know, that there's 15 points awarded as a maximum to the, oh goodness, to the first column or second column, excuse me, and then a, a maximum of three points for all the other columns. I just, um, I don't feel I really understand how the weighting of this works. And uh, since a number of the comments that were made were complaining about, and with some justification, it seemed to me, uh, making complaints about uh, items uh, relegated to the very bottom of the list in terms of their ranking, um, I'd like to have a better handle on uh, why, why some things are valued in some ways and other things are valued in others. Simple as that. Well, uh, I would say, first of all, that the scoring is, it was done last year for the first time in many, many years. Uh, so I would say it's, it is still to some extent a work in progress. Uh, we, we inquired of other communities that do the scoring, you know, what do they, how do they do their scoring? How do, what criteria did they use? Uh, I think we found both last year and then through even after some tweaks this year, we found that some of the criteria seem to overlap depending on the kind of project. Some of the studies that were referred to, um, it's very hard to do the scoring and, and say that it's going to be, uh, it's going to generate a, a specific concrete improvement to a service when it's only a study and the study is to, to see if there needs to be a concrete improvement to a service, for example. So the, the criteria is still um, in the works, I would say. The other point that I, that I made in the, in the cover memo is, with, respect to, is, with respect to the amount of money that's available or, or presumed to be available for capital projects, um, it's clear that some difficult decisions have to be made um, because we don't have we don't have enough money in in any six year window in all likelihood um, to cover all of the uh, all of the projects and improvements that are required. So um, decisions had to be made that certain projects uh, could be accommodated or would be accommodated, and others would be would be moved forward or, or yeah moved out in time I, I i should say um to when they are better able to be afforded i think the scoring i, I think it, it could we could get to the point where the scoring helps inform the prioritization um but it but at this point it's the the dollars that are available are really helping you know, are, are driving that to to a large degree in terms of what is available um, in any in in the upcoming six year window and, and what has to be deferred until until a later date. And then, this, you know, some of those decisions were made before the CIP subcommittee reviewed these projects. Um, and it's it's certainly possible that the uh, that the city council through its through its review of the CIP, which will start next month, um, could decide that uh, to, to have some different priorities and, and make some make some different different decisions about what should be uh, funded, not only in 2021 but in in uh, the upcoming six years. Okay. I Jerry, I'll suggest you join the subcommittee. We, we go through this debate every year. That's why I started my remark by saying, how do you compare a $15 million overall project, the emergency services with $45,000? And the ratings, as far as I'm concerned, really don't work. We change them every year. We try. Um, we'll change them again next year. But you know, Bruce, some of those $45,000 things are studies and it never hurts to have a couple of projects shovel ready because 
from time to time, funding becomes available. Oh, I agree, I agree. Yes, and if they're not ready, you, you don't have time to get them ready and take advantage of I agree. Of I agree. I'm just illustrating how difficult it is to come up with a ranking system that when you look at the results and you say, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. And it just, it's really hard. Uh, I don't mean to grossly oversimplify something that's in fact very complicated, but you presumably had some kind of a document that you were working with in the first place. I'm talking about the subcommittee that gave you some kind of steering about how you're, you know, these various. Yeah, absolutely. If you like a copy, we can get you a copy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, we can certainly send you the, the scoring criteria. It does it does give some further guidance to the subcommittee as, as to what it is they're considering with each of those brief titles. Right. It would be very helpful to have that. So, yes, I'd like to volunteer. Yeah, to get and, it. And, you know, if you can come up with uh, new ideas, we'd love them. Yeah, the other thing is we're voting now to send this along to the, the city council. Correct. And uh, I, if I were a member of the city council, I think I'd flip to the to the rating thing at the end here and, and uh, take a look at that. Maybe, I mean, if I had the faintest idea where to go from the document in the first place, I think I'd go there right away just to see how the, uh, how the planning board felt about things. And... Um, Remember that Jim Winnie is on the city council, so he'll, he'll be able to speak to it, having listened to this debate. And I intend to be on that call also. Um, so I think the two of us will put some perspective on that question. Okay. So can, can I ask a question as well? Um, I, yeah, I would. Yep, absolutely. Who's that? I, it's Kim. Kim. I just want to be clear that I'm clear on what exactly we're approving. Is it the the entire document with not just the spreadsheet, but also the meeting minutes, which included the comments? And and then and maybe answer that question first, and then I have a follow up. Yeah, I mean, I don't. You are. The, the minutes are a reflection of the subcommittee's uh, discussion. But the full board, in, in adopting the, the capital improvement program, you're adopting basically that first spreadsheet that lists all the projects with uh, which year uh, funding is being proposed. The, the project descriptions themselves, in effect, which is available on the city's website, and I can make sure everybody's got got a link to that if, if you haven't found it um, and then the scoring so I don't think you're I don't think you're specifically a, uh, imp approving the the minutes of the subcommittee's meeting per se you'll do that in a few minutes uh, as part of tonight's meeting um, but you're adopting the, the planning tool that says here are some of the capital improvement uh, projects that the city needs to undertake in the in the in the foreseeable future and we recommend that these certain projects uh, get funded in 2021 and then next year we will almost start the process over we will review the projects that got funded in 2021 and then um, identify if any new priorities have emerged and then we will fit them in and we'll come up with a new six year period. Ideally, it should reflect a lot of the same, many of the same projects, uh, but new uh, new issues get, uh, new, new issues arise. And some of these projects may get taken care of in other ways. The, uh, that $45,000 complete street studies is proposed to get funded. We're, you know, we, had, we would anticipate funding that through our operating budget if it doesn't get funded uh, in some other way. Uh, and we would break it into pieces if we have to do that. So, um, And essentially we're really just approving year 2021 because next year we can change anything beyond that, right? Well, no, the, the planning board, again, the CIP is a planning document to a certain extent um, and, and shows a reflection of these are the capital improvements that the city needs to accommodate uh, the growth that it anticipates to see in the next six years. The city council 
uh, controls the purse strings and and they would be controlling um, and approving if they choose to do so what they appropriate in terms of capital funding in 2021. The council's not going to look beyond 2021 because they only do the budget one year at a time. But the planning board is identifying that full six years and, and in this case, six plus years as the as a as a representation of the of the physical and, and infrastructure improvements that that need to be undertaken by the city. Now, I, it doesn't say anything in here about going beyond the six years, but I like that idea of stretching it out to 10 or something like that. I think it makes a lot more sense. So all, right, all so all we're approving are the items and we're not we're we're not um weighing in on how those items may um may be handled. So I'm thinking specifically about um conversations we had about um uh looking at at green buildings or turning non-green buildings into green buildings. We we yeah. don't we we can comment on that in a meeting, but we're not weighing in on that in our approval of this document. Is that right? Um, not directly. I think the the comments that you're making will go to both the council and then will ultimately for for projects that get funded will will circle back to the department that's going to undertake that project, and so they will see that you know if if one of these facility projects gets approved. For example, the station two, uh, the West Lebanon Fire Station two. Yeah. Um, if 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 it is reflected in there that making sure that that's uh, a green and energy efficient building, it gets attached to this document and and the record as it moves forward to the to the full council. Um, then yes, it, it it will ultimately get back to that department, the fire department in this case, um, as they take the appropriation and move it forward to a consultant and say, hey, what, one thing you need to consider is, is to make sure that this is a green building. So you're not you're not going to be the the planning board is not the party that's going to make sure the fire station gets built or, or how it gets built. That's going to be managed by the department. But you can certainly weigh in and, and recommend your thoughts to the city council. And the city council, when they appropriate the funds, can can uh, inform the city manager and the administration of certain goals and expectations. And, and then again, that makes its way back down to the department to be implemented. So board members, we need to move on. Um, we have Dan Nash, who's been patiently waiting to give us his presentation, and then three sets of minutes to approve, and we're down to almost half an hour. So I'm going to call the vote on this motion. Uh, I approve. Gregorio? Yes, I approve. Jeremy? Jerry? Yeah, Jerry votes aye. Joan? Joan votes yes. Jim? Council Winnie votes aye. Kathy? Kathy votes yes. And Kim? Kim votes yes. All right, thank you all. I thought it was a really good discussion. All right, moving on with our agenda, we have a conceptual review of the William G. Nason uh, property, and I see that Dan Nash is with us. So Dan, perhaps you could give us an overview uh, of this. Uh, conceptual project. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Dan. I think you're muted again. I heard a few words, Dan. He's muted. Dan, you must be now? muted. Yeah, keep going. OK, I guess I was unmuted. I muted myself because I thought I was muted. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a 40 acre parcel. The owner would like to split off two lots 
and the minimum zoning in the zone is the three acre lot and he'd like to be able to let those two lots that he creates be in current use and you have to have at least 10 acres of land to be in current use so we had the layout that we proposed um to set up the piece and achieve the owner's goals um lot one has a um, a large amount of frontage and has a driveway on Eastman Hill Road. We wanted to have um, lot two be able to use that common driveway and have frontage, and lot three has frontage further down on Eastman Hill Road on the corner. Kathy, I know you had a question from earlier. Dan, there are two parcels on there that are labeled 125-19. One is southeast of lot two and the other one is behind the lots across the road. So that seems to be um, incorrect somehow. Where's the other 125? Oh, okay, I see it. You got them? Um, I see it. I'll, I'll take a look at that and we'll correct yeah. that. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, other board a, members comments. I have a question. Yep, Joan. Okay, so I see Dan that lot one and lot two are you're planning to have them use the same driveway. Because um, that's the only way lot two can go. Um, and I see lot three is going to be on the curve. Right. Um, what about yes. that little that little uh, that tiny little bit piece of lot one? that also is right near, well, it's between the two curves. Uh, what about it? Well, I guess, is that that there because lot one might down the road want to subdivide and then that would give another access to like the back part of the lot? Um, if you're familiar with Eastman Hill Road, it's very steep. Right. And the terrain on either side of the road is very steep. So it right. would be difficult to um, have another driveway on lot one. The challenge for these lots is going to be access. And that's what, when I come back to you with a, a formal subdivision proposal, that um, we're going to have to have an idea on how we access these lots to access the buildable portions of the lot. Well, I, I just was wondering, you know, because lot three is on the curve and and, and even though uh, I seem to remember, well, as I, my memory is that it's quite treacherous um, that both the hill, the cur both curves and the straightaway in between them, they're all going uphill at a pretty good clip. So I just was wondering if lot three, because that one only can come off of the curve there somewhere, if that one would want the maximum amount of distance to to be able to do, you know, like a cross the fall line kind of thing, we could um, we could easily remove that little piece of frontage if that's a concern. That's no problem. Well, it's not a concern. I just I'm remembering that that's the, that the road is quite steep, a lot of it, and then you've got those two curves, which yeah, don't make it any better. <laughs> Well, and then it right. looks like there's a stream crossing there, too. Yeah. So, Dan, my, my concern is lot three, if that were to be buildable, uh, the line of sight for a driveway, I think, would be really tricky. I'm, I'm going yeah. up and down that road on almost a daily basis. And um, I went past not one of these houses, but a house further up. Uh, just as somebody was coming out and all of the houses along that road uh, have limited line of sight. So as you said, lot three is steep coming down to the road and then on a road that's all also turning that I think is going to be really tricky. Yes, <laughs> that's the challenge. So, so the question is, Dan, looking at lot three, it kind of looks like a table with legs on both sides. <laughs> um, why did you create that fat leg on the table on the right rather than letting lot two go straight back there 
and then giving lot three a wider leg on the left to make it easier to bring in a driveway on a hill. Uh, when I looked at the topography, the the real the best sites for the house um, are up where two and three are together on the common property line with 140-11. So the, that's the buildable sites up there. And I may even have to create another driveway um, next to lot one's driveway and have lot two and three have a common driveway with an easement for lot three through lot two. Okay. We yeah. haven't gotten that far in the driveway planning, but the, the best buildable area is over on the right corner there on the end of those lots two and three. Mm. And then down on, on the little lot that's labeled, one of the ones labeled 125-19 that has a house on it there. There's like the line around the house. What What is that like setbacks? It seems to cross over into lot two. What is that? wide curvy line. line. That's okay. Somebody, that's the clearing that's shown from the city CIS system. When, when they fly it and map the, the roads and the trees, they can see the tree line. So where it's cleared is inside that line. Okay. So those are just trees over there. Okay. Yeah. So it's cleared around the house and the driveway and everything else is wooded. Monroe here. It just seems like because that road is really pretty treacherous and really hard seems like you want to try to not have have a driveway off the curve i know it would shorten it but on the other hand boy i mean i i can i've driven those a couple of times in winter and and, they, and they're steep and they're sharp and you don't have good tires or you don't have four-wheel drive it's really dicey because you go get going down and you're just going faster and faster and faster but that's why I'm looking at letting yeah, that common driveway lot provide, provide frontage, but not a driveway. And okay. the portion where the lot one's driveway goes on to Eastman Hill Road is much more favorable for a yeah. driveway because it's less steep and has more sight right. distance in either direction. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Other board members. Staff, any further thoughts? Uh, Tim, I, I don't have anything at this time. Thank you. Well, it sounds like that is the feedback, Dan. I hope that's helpful. It sounds like you're already uh, well aware of all of those issues. <laughs> no such thing as a simple job. Yeah. Lan, they're not making it anymore. <laughs> nope. All the easy pl places are gone. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. Good luck. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Dan. All right, last items on our agenda are three sets of minutes. So we have two of the CIP meeting minutes um, that I went over. I mean, you've read them. I certainly went over them, and I think they're fine. Um, any comments on those two sets of minutes? I have a question. Church, John. It, it just seems a little odd. I would ask David, is this what we've done in the past? It, it just seems a little odd to approve minutes where we weren't there. Well, Joan, it's like being absent at one of our meetings and then coming back when the minutes get uh, reviewed. You well, get I, to vote on them, right? I, I always feel uncomfortable doing that. And sometimes I, I just abstain. Well, yeah, I, think, I, I don't allow you to abstain. <laughs> I think because the CIP committee only meets a couple of times a year, 
and it doesn't make sense to have these minutes sit until next July or August for the for the next CIP subcommittee because right. it, again it may not be the same people. So uh, I think the chair is correct that if you you know feel free to I, I think you you can be free to accept them uh, or to vote okay. to accept them if they're if they're grammatically correct and they they you know they're understandable. Yeah, more than grammatically correct, they're coherent and they seem to impart information that people would be interested in. We have an excellent recording secretary. We, we do, we do, which makes approving the minutes much, much easier. Monroe makes a motion to approve the minutes from Thursday, August 13 and Thursday, August 20 of the Lebanon Planning Board CIP committee. A second. Second by Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Any discussion? So I'll do a roll call starting this time with Jim Winnie. Jim? Councilor Winnie votes aye. Kathy? Kathy votes yes. Kim? Kim votes yes. I vote yes. Gregorio? Gregorio votes yes. Uh, Jerry? Jerry votes aye. And Joan? Joan votes yes. And that leaves us the minutes from August 24th. Any comments? I have one, one note. Um, Joan. First. Monroe here on page one, line 19. I think it means attorney consultations may be non meetings or voted non public sessions, putting in the word B. E. Okay. That's it for me. Uh, I see Mr. Nissen has joined us. <clears throat> We've uh, reviewed your project, um, and I think Dan Nash has left. So unfortunately, he came a little too late for the discussion. Uh, any other comments? Motion to uh, approve. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask. Monroe, motion to yeah. approve the minutes as amended. And a second. Kathy seconds. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and I'll start with Kathy this time. Yes. And Kim? Yes. And I approve Gregorio. Gregorio approves. Jerry? Jerry approves. Joan? Joan approves. And Jim? Councilor Winnie votes aye. And one last motion. Motion to adjourn, Monroe. Thank you, Joan. Second, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Any discussion? So I'm going to start this time. I agree, Gregorio. Yep, Gregorio agrees. Jerry. Jerry go, uh, agrees. Yeah. Joan. Joan agrees. Jim. Councilor, when he votes aye. Kathy? Kathy votes yes. And Kim? Yes. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Good night, everybody. Very good discussion. Good night. Good night. Thank you all.